guys, Kevin Mitch here on the Big Head Pod, just sitting down, sitting here thinking about some of the whiskey that we've been been uh, privy to, being a part of the sponsor here on our show, Herman Marshall Whiskey. You guys get a chance to drink this stuff, try it out. The single malt is by far the best one they have. There's four kinds. They have a single malt, they have a blend, they have a bourbon, they have a rye. The order I would go in is a single malt by far. I just found this. Don't ever try and take this from me. I might have to beat you with the bottle. Then the rye, the blend, and then the bourbon. This stuff is phenomenal. Texas made and Texas produced here, guys. This stuff is unbelievable. So if you get a chance to do it, go grab yourself a bottle. This stuff is amazing. Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's guest is a former professional golfer, first one I've ever had. He is now the CEO and co-founder of Surf and Turf Golfware. Welcome, Mr. Taylor Artman. Taylor, how are you, sir? Pretty good, pretty good. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Abs- absolutely, absolutely. I know I, I know. we text back and forth about the the big thing, people golf and baseball and everything else. But before we get, get down to all that, you know, g- golf's not a sport that where I grew up where it's something that kids were playing a lot of. You know, so being and you know, you're a younger guy. I mean, we're young, I guess. So being, you know, playing now and, and doing that. So playing high school, growing was this something you did as a kid, or was it just something you picked up later in life? I mean, I started playing until I was probably by playing. I mean, actually getting pretty good at it, not until I was playing baseball in mid twenties. Right, you started taking it uh, actually yes. seriously as a sport rather than just messing around. <laughs> yeah, just recreational. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, occasional beer drinking and uh, college idiots just being out there hacking up a golf course. It's funny because I'm like the Benjamin Button of that. I did it in reverse order, so now I just play and you know drink beer and mess around. I don't. <laughs> <I'm> yeah. Like, <laughs> so like I said, playing and stuff. You start this as a kid, where you. You know, is it something your dad played? You watch. I had brothers. I was playing baseball. Golf wasn't something. It was just like now my son will go in the backyard and I'm afraid it's Plinko trees everywhere. I'm waiting for one to come through the glass of the house. <laughs> I got a funny story about that too, but uh, no, my dad used to take me out, out actually to the course. Um, he would walk nine holes. He was a really good player in my hometown. Uh, not, not a pro or anything, but like won the club championship, you know, one, one of the better players in town. Uh, and my uncle was too. Uh, and then, my dad used to take me out. He'd carry me on one arm and his clubs on the other. Uh, and he would, yeah, he, my uncle was, let, um, well, uh, I'll back up. He would, he cut down a club for me. And then I had little plastic clubs too, but one real club. And uh, yeah, he'd take me out there and mess around. You know, I'd be in the bunker or whatever. I wouldn't be really doing much. But then he'd sit, you know, I have a small attention span and uh, I'd, I'd hit shots. And whenever he wasn't looking, uh, I would flip the club around and hit shots. And he would always get confused. He'd, he'd correct me. And then uh, I just kept doing it. And I hit it pretty good with the back of the club. And then one day um, he went and got from my, from another uncle of mine who was left-handed. He got it cut down. And then like my first shot, I just like, you know, striped it. And uh, yeah, so he took me out there when I was like three years old. I, I got some home videos that are pretty cool. And then, uh, yeah, I figured out I was left-handed not far after that. But that's where I started. And then uh, after that, it was a different time back then, right? And, uh, my parents, they'd be, especially like, um, when I was like seven or eight, you know, in elementary school or whatever, or especially during the summer, they would just drop me off at the golf course in the summer at like eight or 9 AM. And, uh, they'd pick me up at five. Oh, wow. Or my so that was your camp. Would, you that know. was your day. Here you yeah, go. Yeah. Yeah. I always joke that, uh, yeah, the, the head pro there. Tim Fleming, uh, I always joke with him that he was like my first babysitter, <laughs> but there was a bunch of little kids out there. Um, and we would just, you know, from age like seven to, I don't know, 13 to 15 or something, you know, we don't, we wouldn't always be playing golf. We'd go mess around with the pool or the snack bar, or just, you know, wreck havoc around there. But, uh, yeah, used to, that used to be where I got dropped off and that was okay back then. So were you, so so golf was it. You didn't. You weren't doing any other shit. You weren't baseball, football, anything like that. No, I played about every sport. Uh, I mean, well, that Oklahoma has to offer. We don't have hockey, we don't have lacrosse, or anything. But I played basketball. I uh, played football uh, up until football to like only like seventh grade. Baseball till like seventh or eighth grade. Basketball all the way through. Um, and then in high school, I only played AAU. I didn't play on my high school team. Um, and then, but golf around sixteen, I started saying okay. There's only one of these sports that uh, I am 
able to, you know, be at the highest level. Uh, uh, and so I started focus on golf about right about 16. Uh, I, I kind of gave up AU basketball. Um, that was my last, the last two it came down to, but I mean, that was a no brainer. Is your then, school uh, a good, is it a golf? I mean, I, I don't know about golf schools, you know, I don't, somebody asked me what good golf program down here in Texas yeah, we, would be as far as high school, I wouldn't have a good. clue. We were six A, uh, so the biggest, uh, you know, the big one of the bigger schools. Evan North, though, at the time they have, man, I, I don't even know how many. They got at least three PGA Tour players um, just from the guys that I played against on that top five, uh, and the, they were obviously outstanding. So they won every year that we played. And then Jinx High School, which is a big uh, football, a big sports school in Tulsa. They finished second, and we finished third every year uh, that we were that I was in high school. So we were one of the best. If we didn't go through uh, high school against those two teams being so strong, we would have been, you know, a contender for state. We had five or six college golfers, which is pretty rare, I would say. So did you guys do a lot of out of state travel? You know, with with you know, there's some of these schools with the sports. You know, some will travel out of state is. You know, golf is not, it's one, it's expensive to go play on these courses, right? And trying to find sure. time to play. So how was it, how was you guys set up travel wise and doing that stuff? With our high school team, we were actually one of just a couple schools that did go out of state. We'd come down to Texas and play against like Highland Park and Denton Geyer and, uh, you know, a couple of these, uh, the schools in North Texas uh, with Edmond North. Um, and that, that was the only travel we would do as a team. Um, but uh, individual golf is actually, that's where you get recruited. That, that's where I would say, I mean, you know, like I, I was all state and whatever, but I would say for sure that, um, a couple of tournaments that I signed up with very late in my uh, career, amateur tournaments and how I finished, that's what, uh, you know, got me more college looks. And, uh, to be honest, like my high school career, it just doesn't get looked at like that. And I didn't play national tournaments, uh, like some kids did. Um, but I think it worked out for me, uh, you know, like at, when it's all said and done at the time, I was like, man, I wish I could play all those, but, uh, you just got to play what you, what you play. And, uh, it, that's where golf, I think is kind of like where other sports are. I think baseball seems to be the same way. Your traveling team is where you get recruited. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's kind of where golf is your individual, your AJGAs, your, your amateur, uh, events, things like that. Um, and then high school, obviously it falls in line, but it's not quite as uh, competitive, I'd say. So, you know, with I me, mean, so playing golf, right. If you're playing on a course, these can be torn up a lot. So, I mean, you're thinking about working on, you know, swinging a golf club, not on the range, but on the course itself and, and being able to, cause, you know, I, I take beaver pelts when I take a divot, depending on where I am, it's Bermuda or something, back, to, which is, you know, I can put it back, but that's a lot on a golf course, especially if you're playing as much as you are. So how are you able to, to, you know, probably other than, you know, because hitting off of a, a turf mat does nothing. Right. And you can't oh, no. get any read off anything. So how would you know, so how many courses <laughs> would you tear up doing this? Oh, I mean, we practice all we had, we practice every course in our hometown. And then um, I mean, we I, we play tournaments all the time. But m my main thing growing up is I was obsessed with the short game. And so um, I always just wanted to do putting contest or have up and down contest or whatever. And my game showed I was not I was not a very uh, great ball striker. I was always no, I kind of hit it everywhere, uh, but got up and down. I really pissed a lot of people off like in match play and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but whereas some guys were just always on the range. Right. And then, you know, I couldn't make a putt. I think there's kind of two styles. It just depends on what you fall in love with. Um, I was always just very creative. I think it's because I'm left-handed. I don't know. And so I would rather sit on the range and hit shots that go like this and, you know, rather than just hit over and over and over again. Um, and so I, I just had more fun. just like creating shots, but then I'd get in trouble when I'd play in the in tournaments or on the course. I'd be like, um, I don't really have a straight shot here <laughs> you yeah. know, or whatever. <laughs> and so, yeah, I'd just find a way to get in the hole, but that's what golf is. So, you know, and that's where, I think that it's a unique sport. There's a lot of ways that you can skin a cat out there. I remember I played with Hank Haney one time and he talked about Tiger Woods. His fairways hit are, are lower, I guess, down on the right. But he said Tiger would rather be, you know, 150 yards in the crap than, you know, than 250 in the fairway. Because he was just, it, like you said, you're trying to get to a point as fast as you can. But if you learn For to sure. play through it, 
And, and I said, I said, I think about that, right? Because everybody, want, you think about perfection, right? Golf is probably as far as that part of the mental game of, like you said, just being able to continuously ha- hit balls. I mean, I my brother was a scratch golfer, and I'd see him pull shots out that I would wouldn't even fathom trying to hit something, right? So I mean, but that's is that yeah. part of your learning process that you saw it as a, as a young kid, or is that just something you just kind of develop as you progressed? Um, I started developing it more and making it more. I started practicing more of the purpose. Um, I remember in like uh, high school, I guess, yeah, I guess high school, um, I started doing like competitive practice. There was like two or three of us. Um, and they, like, um, at, oh, you know, you T- Taylor Gooch was one of them. And then myself, and then another kid or two, uh, with the ball brothers. Uh, it was Steve ball and Stan ball, mainly Stan ball at the time. Um, and they kind of worked with us like to do, uh, competitive practice. So to actually use those shot shaping or like messing around competitively and like put pressure on ourselves rather than just trying shots. Right. And so that was where, that was a turning point where I started, uh, you know, really, practicing with a purpose. And I think that that turned me into a pretty good player versus just a, a young junior golfer, you know, that was pretty solid. I started becoming a player after that um, and learning that skill set. And that was developed, you said, through, out of, through high school into college? Yeah, I started it in high school. I remember that that was something that he kind of pulled a couple of us aside and we, and we worked together. And then um, so that I remember and then traveling, you know, that that kind of sprung into kind of winning some bigger events, going to some national tournaments, seeing who's out there, right? Some of these great players out there. Um, and so you start crossing paths with, uh, you know, guys in my class would have been like Ricky Fowler. Um, you know, they're great, they're great players. I mean, Ricky's the best player I've ever played with. Um, and so once I got saw a piece of that, I was like, man, there's some really good players out here. And you start learning from them and you just can't wait to get back out there again, you know? And then, uh, and then when you take that to college, uh, I was fortunate. I played at a school that was a small school. Um, so we were kind of underrated and whatnot, but we got in a lot of international players and, uh, the majority of my teammates actually played professionally. Uh, even though we, we played a small school, Oklahoma city university, we won nationals in NAIA. Mm -hmm. So not, you know, not a big D1 deal or anything, but looking back, I think it really helped develop me as a player because I had some very competitive, uh, strong teammates from all over the world, from South Africa, Norway, Sweden, England, Australia, I mean, you name it, uh, South America, Mexico. And uh, I think that that really made me a better player once I started playing with those guys because they brought games, man, some of the South Africans and Australians, they they ra- got raised with perfect swings. Uh, they hit it so good, you know, uh, um, and that they learned things from us, but uh, we learned things from them, obviously. And then uh, the Scandinavians, they were they were crafty. And, the, you know, uh, my English teammate was one of the best putters I ever played with. And uh, that that takes a lot for me to say that, but he was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but the diversity, but you hear about it, you know, that's what you see in – you know, as in uh, baseball, like you said, all over dip, but you're talking about different approaches to the, you know, to the same game you're playing. Right. So you, so you kind of feed off each other and learn and, yeah. and, and, and doing that and, you know, playing in college, and like you said, you're playing in these, in these national tournaments now. So how, you know, how does, how do you go from college to the professional level? I mean, I know we just saw this week was that girl Rose, I think she was at Stanford or whatever. She just won the for whatever event it was. I just saw it today. Mm-hmm. And she just came right out of college, correct? So I Yeah. And what she I think was, that was invited. The first pro event, I believe. Yes, it was. She won it yeah. and I think in I think it was two holes. Uh, they played and that's be, beyond rare. <laughs> yes. That's I from mean, what uh, I saw, yeah. And she, you could tell the nerve, you know, missing some, the putts and stuff, but you could tell how stoic she was. Uh, but just seeing that. So how did you you know, how do you make that jump, the transition from college to the professional ranks? Um, you know, I think that everybody takes it differently. There's some guys that, um, uh, they just, they had it right. Right. Like a mm-hmm. Ricky Fowler or, or, you know, or Kevin Tway that I grew up with or uh, Taylor Gooch, you know, that they, they went to Oklahoma state, they were world beaters. They were, they were on their level. Um, and you know, but they still had to fight through the mini tours and all that too. Well, not Ricky, but the others did. Um, and like, I think there's different levels of uh how you get there but it 
I would say that my teammates um, and some of them, you know, still play on the European or, or challenge tour, et cetera. And guys right before me, uh, they came from a small school. They worked their way up. And I think that at our school, we had kind of a chip on our shoulder. We didn't get the respect like the big uh, D1 schools got. And so, um, you know, we'd always take pride in playing in D1 tournaments as the NAIA school. And we fared really well. And then I think when we uh, went on to professional, I just always told myself that I've made it to the top of every level, uh, one way or another. I've never been the top of my class, but I've always uh, made the, you know, I've always kept advancing, right? Yeah. Um, at, at every level. And so, and I always uh, laugh, like, I think it was Kevin Kisner that said they pay a lot for 20th. Um, because I, I was never, I was never the type of guy that was going to win. Right. I, I don't, I don't shoot 63s or whatever, but, um, I was always really, uh, in my, and I'm confident in saying it, I, like really strong, uh, no matter the condition, uh, I just didn't let rounds go. I never quit. And so maybe I wouldn't uh, amaze anybody, but usually after four rounds, you count them up and I would be up there somewhere. So, uh, I always told myself that if I just kept advancing, all I need to do was get out there. Unfortunately, I, uh, you know, I, I didn't never make it to the, to the top, uh, you know, of the totem pole. And so the highest I ever played was PGA tour Canada played many tours all over. I gave it a shot. I had played a lot of Q schools, a lot of, a lot of different, um, events and a lot of different places. Uh, I had some good finishes. I had a couple of rough years. I learned how mentally, uh, you know, challenging it can be. And that, that was a, a new one for me. I, I never lost a mentally and I did for about two years, but, um, I, I learned a lot. And I think that took me into my business too, was, uh, just how to persevere through that. But I would say ultimately the transition, I tell my niece is a D one college golfer now. And I, and I tell her, um, you know, the main thing is just, uh, you know, no matter what it is you're going to do, you have to play your own game and you've got to just continue to prove that, that game that you have. Right. And you can't worry about other people. You can't worry about the, what they think, nothing. Everybody's different and uh, to stay in the present. And then uh, a, a lot of it, I think is just avoidance, you know, like stay out of your own way. And uh, you're usually good enough. If you've already made it to that level, you will be good enough. And you know that from baseball and anybody that's played any sport, if you've worked that hard, most of the time, it's not about like everything you do that's great. You know, it's just staying out of your own way um, and just letting them add up at the end, right? Yeah, yeah. You're that's the biggest thing. It's it's the mental side that, that separates. You know, those 100%. the ones the 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 athletes. It's not it's not this physical skill, right? So you know, you, you talk about you know the the mental side of it. So. When we like, when we would go out and play golf right now, we go out and play. Yeah. You know, there'd be talking, there'd be all kinds of of you know chirping back and forth. So playing on sure. on on tour, playing at, in these in these many in these uh, these events, is it is what 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 kind of the, the atmosphere? Because is it kind of like if you're out there with your buddies Ooh. talking, or is, is there some trash talk going, or is it you know I. I said, really, the only sport you hold up a sign says quiet, please. Really? Right. I mean, so, it, so <laughs> you know, question. talk about that because I'm sure that can wear on you because I'm sure, especially if it's quiet, you can probably hear somebody back. Like, this guy sucks. Right. <laughs> you can hear it. Right. You're just, <laughs> I think a train horn went off the other day. A guy was getting ready to putt and the train horn went off and he <laughs> just backed away from it for a second. No, that's, that's a good question. Um, well, so the, the unique thing is we play, we gamble all the time. We're mm -hmm. pretty much professional gamblers when you're out there. And so when we're not in a tournament, you know, there's a traveling group or a bunch of guys or, or a, a few different groups, right? And we combine, we play different games. We're always playing each other, money games. There's a lot more banter trash talk going on between those, but we're all friends also. Right. Yeah. Um, and then when, so when you get in tournaments, it just kind of depends. Sometimes you'd be paired with buddies that can be either a plus or that can be a minus. It's almost too lackadaisical out there. And it's like, what are you, you know, what are you doing? Like, pull your, you know, yeah. this is, <laughs> where's my beer? Yeah. Let me grab yeah, my beer. Like, why you am I just like, you know, I, I, did I even line up that last shot? You know, what am I doing? And cause I'm so, sitting so there talking like to my Cup, friends. Then? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I'm you know, sitting there it? BSing with my buddies. Yeah. And I'm like, I don't even think I got the yardage right. Like I just, you know, <laughs> like I was messing around and I, you know, and so that would happen occasionally, but also I think that, that usually I would not, not just me, but I think players play better when they play with their friends. I remember, uh, my business partner, Michael, 
Um, so I got hurt in like 17 and had a shoulder surgery. I was out for nine months. And then he kind of talked me into coming back and playing some tournaments. And um, I didn't really want to. And Surf and Turf was taken off and I was really busy. I'm not playing any golf. And he was like, well, let's go play this Bogey Hills tournament. And uh, I'd always finished like top 10 the, the two or three, four years before that. And uh, so this course was really tight and short and kind of janky. It's actually kind of squirrely, like it fit my game, right? Because I'm mm -hmm. kind of squirrely. And uh, he's this long hitter or whatever. He usually didn't like it. But we get, I sign up, go play. It's like my first tournament. And we're having, but we get paired together, which was, and he, you know, finished second in the long drive thing before the tournament. Oh, he had I'm something to do with it. He said, I'm up just that trying way. to figure out how to play golf again, right? Or yep. whatever. And so we get out there and he wins the tournament, but the first two rounds, he shot like six, I don't remember, six, 65, 66 or something like that. He was uh, maybe like 13 under. I shot my 74s, missed a cut and, you know, was headed home. And I was like, Hey man, for the next two days, just keep playing like you're playing. Cause these two days, it was like, you know, we were playing back home in a money game. You're cutting corners. You're just, uh, you're owning the course. And you just keep doing that. You're going to make a couple of bogeys, sure. But you are you just keep doing that. And I think uh, he, he kept it up. He won the tournament. But I think that us playing together was an example of, you know, you kind of let loose and he kind of, you know, because that course didn't suit him at all. But he, he made it work. And also, I think he just wanted to just one last time to just drum me. But <laughs> Yeah, you're trying <laughs> so, to relearn a swing after shoulder surgery. That's not something that's easy to do. Yeah, so it, it, but it, it was fun. I, I remember playing with it. We played with another guy. I, I remember Jose Toledo was playing with us, um, and he's uh, he wears our stuff um, on the Latin America tour. But we just had a good time, um, and I remember him playing really good. And so I think sometimes when you play with your buddies, you play really well. Um, there's another time I'm playing with Michael, and I had some demons and another guy. I don't want to say his name, um, but we were both notoriously slow, and Michael was playing with us and uh we were roommates at the time and business partners or whatever maybe, maybe not business partners yet but we've been roommates for a while we travel together and we are on the clock and he is shooting like 77 and i swear he wanted to just like punch both of our lights out and just head in or what he was done with us he wanted to just continue to play uh one of the guys got fined i got warned and then michael shot probably the worst score i've ever seen him shoot so it can go both ways <laughs> <laughs> so we, we i've played he wouldn't baseball. talk to me for a week after that he was like dude i can't play with you right now so you, you were the you were, you were the human rain delay then out there I, the well the, yeah i was just barely faster than the other guy but if, but i was slow as shit so were you? no you're good no you're good <laughs> no I, i've yeah, seen I those people back from some right stuff. that have that you know that their bags it's you know it's a car path and i said they'll get their bag and then they'll walk all the way out to their ball then they walk all the way back to, to get their club and then they walk all out they get the wrong club and they go back is that you I'm one of those ones where, eh, I would, we're between, I had this let's deal, go. If you've seen like uh, like Keegan Bradley or Jason Day a few years ago or something, I was working with a, a sports psychologist and uh, I ha I couldn't like pull the trigger. I, I like, I, it was weird. I just would like get stuck and I couldn't, I couldn't take the club back. I couldn't go. Really? I, I can't, exp I can't explain it. Yeah. And uh, so I'd have to back off and then I'd go in there and it was something I worked on with like a trigger that would initiate me to go and hit and it would like mentally uh, clear my mind and I, and it would enable me to not, you know, get in my own way there. But man, did it take a while? I mean, really? those times I'd back off three, four five times and, and I'm like, I, I'm trying guys. I literally can't pull the club back. And uh, I've never experienced anything like that before, but I, I worked way, I worked my way through it. But um, I don't know what was worse. Uh, the social, downside of when i was i started playing well but i was so slow right i mean yeah. my own roommate and buddy or whatever like refuses to play with me he's like being miserable <laughs> and then uh the you know the, the that year or two before that that led to me seeing a sports psychologist uh well that was pretty miserable but they both in their own way was like dude this sucks i just want to be normal again and finally i got out of it but uh, uh that was kind of toward the end so I'm, I'm picturing I'm, I'm picturing Tin Cup then, like I said earlier. Is that like right? Sports psychologist, he had to, he had the same thing. <laughs> Kinda. Right. The doctor lady. <laughs> yeah. The doctor lady. Doc, I, doc yeah. what is it? Just as opposed to just but I can't imagine of people out there knowing that you can't and right? Because I it, you know, you're you're athletes, right? People, right? Well, you gonna you gonna swing, yeah. you're gonna hit the ball yet, right? Just just kind of doing it. 
And you probably get uh, getting ticked off at, at people. I was, I was getting mad at myself. I'm like, I'm trying to get, what's the deal here? <laughs> you know, um, it, it was, it got weird for a little bit. Uh, and I mean, I finally started overcoming in it and then one, or one day I'd be fine. And the next day it's like every shot. And I'm like, dude, I'm never going to, I'm going to get pen- a fine, not penalized, fined, like, <laughs> like beyond penalty. Um, and so, um, yeah, it got, it got pretty bad, but I, I finally started getting through it. Did the sport? Did they have a name for that? I mean, had anybody heard of this? Have you, you know, because what's when something happens? Usually, most athletes are trying. All right, has anybody dealt with this before? Who can I go talk to? Was there anybody you could really reach out to and just say, "Hey, have you dealt with this before?" Yeah, actually, I did. Um, and so, like when I went to, I, I talked to a guy named Frank Beard, um, and I got a funny story about Frank. But he uh, he was he played a few Ryder Cups. Um, he's out on the uh, West coast. I'll tell a funny story about him in a second if I can. And, um, but he, he, he told me that he went through a similar thing when he was out there and kind of, you know, said that you just need to accept, uh, the results, you know? And so like, whenever you're going up there, just, it's okay to back off once or whatever. But then once you get up there, he's like, just step into it breathe or whatever and just let it go and it's, it's either going to be a good shot or a bad shot and uh that took a while for me to get like comfortable to just let it go but once i did a few times it, it would help um but yeah so the sports psychologist he really helped a lot because i had some inner demons like and I, he he had he did a good job he made me nervous in practice because it was frustrating i would hit every shot like boom boom boom, boom, boom right on the middle and then you go to the first tee and it was like <laughs> every time <laughs> and so uh you know and it's just so demoralizing and so then he'd i'd be like i practice all i want like it doesn't matter i hit it perfect and he goes i bet i can make you nervous and so he like picks a shot he used a bunch of technology and screens and whatnot and he's like all right you got to hit one in between this mark this yellow flag and this red flag and it can't go in the bushes on the right or whatever and he drew up a hole and I got up there and I got all nervous and just quick hit it in the shit. And I was like, what? <laughs> Why'd you like, have to put the bushes there? You could have put there? something else. You could have yeah. put another like, fairway over there. there. And he's like, I told you. I started creating this shot in your head. And uh, I learned a lot from that. And so after that, though, it was necessary to learn that. Because then when I went to practice, one, I, I took Frank Beard's advice and I would just hit my last shot. I used to always like end on a make. Cause like from basketball, right? Oh, yeah, tell them, everybody, it. yeah. And so I went away from that. I still don't end on a make. And I even, uh, I, I've even told my niece that before I, I learned the power of acceptance. So like my last shot is my last shot. And so if I hit the worst shot, I hit the entire bucket of range balls. I just, okay, I gotta, just gotta go hit it again. So I'm just gonna go to the next tee. And that actually helped me. Um, is when, when I did hit a good one, I took confidence. And when I didn't, I'd almost just practice accepting that I might just hit it off the map, you know? And so usually the next shot I'd hit just fine. It's like, I can't, can't hit it worse than that one. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. It's like a, it's like a, that you trick yourself almost. It is right. It's that's what Tim was, Tim Cup was doing. He goes, what, how do you think you look right exactly. now? Hitting chili peppers up Lee Jansen's ass, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. He said, well, take the, t- put the T's in your left pocket, pull your right pocket out, turn your hat sideways. He goes, I, well, I, like an idiot. I mean, I was trying everything. Yeah. He looked <laughs> yeah. like an idiot. Well, what do you think you're doing doing that? There you go. So you're and talking get, about this, this, your Frank Beard story? Yeah. So I'm, uh, I'm playing. And the first time I'd ever been out to the Palms in California, I just moved out there. And they had got kind of junior memberships for um, like developing players and stuff. And a lot of senior tour players out there. And then a couple of guys um, at the time, like Scott McCarron, a couple other guys were out there. And they have this thing called the game. And it's the most, probably the most competitive game in the desert, um, in, in like the Palm Springs area. And so every day, 11 15 or whatever. So you get out there like 10, 10 30, get breakfast, hit, hit balls, and they draw teams. And so one of my first days, maybe my second round in the game, I get paired and it's me. Somebody else, uh, this guy named Dave Hoppy, and then uh, Frank Beard. And it was just Frank, right? And he had a hat, and he's about 74 years old. And I'm riding with uh, Frank and Hoppy and another guy riding together. And first hole, Frank, so you, you get to play your handicap. So, like, I was plus five of the blacks, but I could play plus seven of the blues or five of the blacks or whatever. Frank was, like, plus, uh, like, three or four at the blues, I guess. And he could be, like, a plus five or six of the whites if he moved up one or he could go back and be like a plus two or whatever at the blacks. Yeah. And so he would play the whites 
And I was like, plus six or whatever, you know. It's, he hits it right down the middle, first hole. And I was like, man, that's pretty good. First of all, I was like, plus four, plus six, what? <laughs> you know, 74 years old. And uh, then I'd never heard of him. And uh, he hits it up there like 15 feet, and he rolls it in. And then on number two, he hits like seven iron or something probably, hits it up there like 15 feet. And we get up there, and he just dies it right over the front. Two under after two. And then on number three, he just perfect draw. The same shot every single time, right? Just right down the middle. And he's got this kind of little, well, I was, you know, he's he's just a little quirky, but it's like the perfect move. It is it's so silky. And I go to Hobby, we're on the three fairway, and I said, Frank must have played a little bit or something. Like, he's pretty good. And Hobby's like, yeah, he's pretty good. You ought to ask him. And then so Frank hits it up there on the green. Barely misses his putt. We go to number four tee, and it's like one of the hardest tee shots. And I said, so Frank, uh, I heard you used to play a little bit. Like, what tours did you play on? And he goes, well, uh, not well, not a ton, but a couple Ryder Cups. And just like dead, stri- dead serious. Just And I felt about this big. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, my God. You know, like, I, I don't know. I thought he was like a pharmacist or something. <laughs> There's some really good players out there that did not play professional golf. I, I thought maybe one of State Am once. I don't know. I have no idea. And he's like, yeah, I played a couple Ryder Cups. And I'm just like, okay. That guys are setting I you just, up, too. I just wanted to go home and just or just put my head in the dirt, right? <laughs> I'll take my clubs and I'm going to leave yeah. now. I'm pretty, sure, I'm pretty sure I hit in the shit right after that. I was like, okay, <laughs> this is embarrassing. And you get and out there yeah. and play in that. But, but you're like, you talk about – that's the stuff that's frustrating. Guys that can play, it, you know, right down the middle that are like that, that are two fifty down the middle, right, and they're and doing and doing everything right. And we have to, other guys have to work hard. That's you know, my short game is what I lose is lose playing. You know, the fifty yards and in, I just don't have the touch. My hands, I got, and I have one speed. There's no, there's no <laughs> trying to slow down. It's just go. So that's how I've that's how I've always been. That's so, a death wish with yeah. uh, half wedges. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, exactly. So I've I've kind of learned a little bit how to. We played with uh, David Lingmurth one time at a at a pro am and his caddy out here just a little bit just listening. And I spent a winter in Tampa playing, um, <clears throat> working with the pro there. So I, I've I've learned. I've never really been other than that. I've been self taught just trying to do stuff. So you know, baseball and, and the golf swing, people go, well, base, the golf swing is going to mess up your baseball. I said, no, it's not. It's all in your head. Actually, I played better <laughs> baseball when I was playing golf, but yeah. unfortunately during the season, uh, I'm, oh. I don't want to starting pitchers can. So those guys are always playing and, and everything else, but it's, but you know, learning now it's, it's still not something I can sit and really watch on TV, but going, like you said, going out and playing and, and being with your buddies and, and doing that stuff. So, I mean, that, that's, that's the fun side of, of, of what I, of what I enjoy doing, you know, the playing sure. scrambles, right. Doing that, always having the right guys. And I'm sure you got the right guys. You know, how, who's got their short game. We can call this guy do that. Yeah. No, that's where I'm at right now. That's all I'll play in now is like team stuff and exactly what we just said. Like, uh, you know, we got one coming up. So it's like we got to have a long hitter. We got to have a short game guy. We got to have, you know, somebody. We got to have somebody that's just, just a stud at everything. That usually helps. Uh, yeah. But yeah, you got you got to get different skills, you know, in those yeah. deals. But that's that's what I play in now. That's what I enjoy. That's the only way I can be competitive anymore. Yeah. If I can just uh, hold my role on a team because I can't. I can't piece together, uh, you know, multiple rounds against somebody that's playing full time. And so, but I can, if I, uh, have a teammate and, you know, if I, my two, three bad holes or whatever, that they can carry me yeah. or if we're, you know, if they're hitting long drives, I still am good with a wedge and, and, I, and I can putt pretty good. So, uh, I can still carry my own if I've got some help. Yeah. So, which I kind of have fun with it. I just accept it now and own it. And I actually, in a way I play better because. It doesn't bother me if I hit a bad shot. I don't, uh, you know, stroke play events stress me out. Cause, you know, I don't just, I don't focus on just, you know, getting out there and playing golf because I never get to play anymore. Yeah. And, uh, you know, even though I want to just enjoy myself, but I'm too competitive. I mean, I, I just can't. <laughs> yeah, so it's, a it is it's tough, right? Because that's what you were, that's what yeah, you were. I, I hate it actually. Like I, 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 I need to get past it, but I, yeah, it stresses me out. <laughs> especially every time i get off to a bad start and then i'm just fighting my way back yeah that's what it is i think it's that's when you know people talk gosh 
I can't, I don't think I can do this. You know, it's always, it's always enough. Like you finish 18 when usually it's on a good shot, just enough to make you want to come back. Right. And there's not a time yeah. you just, I've had, you've had enough of it. Right. So, so going, you know, when your career, you know, with coming to an end and the, the, uh, the, the apparel company starting, was this something that was created while you were playing? Or was this something that just somebody had an idea? How did this, how did the surf and turf come about? So actually, I, I can't take uh, full credit for how it really truly started. Um, so I, when I was out in SoCal, uh, a couple of my buddies, uh, they came up with the logo and the name and uh, they created a social club. So it's called the Surf and Turf Club. And so being out in SoCal, it's, it's, a, it's very, there's a huge barrier to entry if you're like a young professional. There's high initiation fees. The courses are expensive. Most are private. And then our big deal was if we had younger buddies out there, whether they visited, whether they were in the service industry and the guys we hung out with or whatever, they'd want to go play some public resort or something. Well, that was courses that we didn't have the perks to play. And so, you know, like we're not going to go pay those green fees or whatever, you know, et cetera, when we've got uh, access to certain other places. But, but then we couldn't get them on at our place, right? And so uh, the Surf and Turf Club was kind of founded as a way to, um, I guess, make it a feasible opportunity to get people to play a few times a year, like maybe a, a member guest or a club championship or something, if you weren't a member of a club. So we created our own club without a golf course. And so we were going to do you know, different things that uh, one idea could be like um, you do a member guest, but it's like all the Surf and Turf Club members would go play with all the palms members in a two-man team so you've met 50 palms members 50 servant or club members right and yep. it's almost like an inner club but it's kind of a member guest etc and so we would bounce around and do that or we would go and play other events and so we'd have a surf and turf club champion etc and we made it super affordable uh, it, you know it was just uh uh the price for a gin handicap and we give a, give out a hat and a t-shirt and so i was like one of the first members of the club and uh then as we kind of kept going they're like you want to join in i said sure well how it turned into an apparel brand well like my hat or something so and they looked a lot worse back then (laughs) but (laughs) but the logo was pretty cool and so people were joining and they'd wear it and we'd get out to a golf course maybe we'd have it on or whatever and somebody would say well i want one of those hats or one of those t-shirts can i buy one we're like can they no I don't know, you're not a member. <laughs> uh, like, I don't think we can. And then we had all of a sudden we had all these people want hats and t-shirts, but they didn't want to want to join the club. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I don't think we can, I don't know what to do here. You know, it's what we, so we were like, let's just have the surf and turf club, but then have the apparel be surf and turf golf. Uh, and of course it goes apparel. And it's kind of like an umbrella over it. And so uh, we still have the club. It's smaller. It's kind of speakeasy, if you will, these days. But uh, uh, we're going to keep growing it. We've got two chapters now: North, uh, I'm sorry, Minnesota and Southern California, and then another one coming here in North Texas. And so um, that's just kind of been a foundational thing. Um, only we're not really growing the brand through it. We're more so just rewarding our original members, and then people that are interested in that have access to it. Um, but it's still super affordable. We, we really don't uh, make anything off of it. We just really want to bring people together. And then uh, over time, uh, I plan to get that back going again and really turn it into like a more social movement. Uh, I just have to focus on one thing at a time. And so, yeah, we, uh, we moved into the apparel sector from there. And we got lucky. We're all in the golf industry, so we have a pretty good network. Mm-hmm. And uh, we understood how wholesale works to clubs. And so we sold to... Well, two of our co-founders were at the plantation, so we sold to them and in the shop. Those went like like that, went fast. And then uh, we sold to another uh, another shop, I can't, I can't remember where it was, um, and went pretty fast. And then we had a buddy, it was that same guy, Dave Hoppy, uh, has a store in Canada. And um, we sent him 144 pieces to take back to his store. And Cam and I, one of my co-founders, we were playing uh, PJ Tour Canada at the time. We were up there and he was like, hey, do you have any more apparel with you? I already sold it in like two weeks. And we were like, what? And like, um, well, we don't have any more. Like, 
anywhere on earth. <laughs> so, um, um, so we're like, okay, we got some. So then I called a place in Texas and uh, I always got a lot of kickback there. I was like, that'll never sell in Texas. That'll never, you know, whatever. No chance outside of uh, California. I'm like, well, I'm from Oklahoma and Texas and I wear it. So, I mean, I don't yeah. think I'm that crazy. And so <laughs> for, uh, I, we sent it to a place in Oklahoma, a place in Texas, uh, and Artesia, New Mexico. And all three of them sold really fast. And all of a sudden we've got, now we got like six or 10 accounts and they're selling 48 at a time, whatever. And it's like, whoa. And then, uh, we, we did that for about a year. We just kept growing a little bit, you know, we'd, we'd order a bunch, sell it and then order 20% more and scale it up and whatever. Mm -hmm. And, um, in 2018, I took a chance, I spent all of our money, <laughs> uh, like max out our credit cards and I sponsored the North Texas PGA. And that caused a little bit of a riff uh, at the time um, between us because it was, you know, it was a bit ballsy, I guess. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't have a full plan, but I just was like, I don't know. They're selling everywhere, so let's just do this. And so, yeah, Max it all out. I had all the stuff shipped. I, need, I was like, Jordan, I need it all. <laughs> so he shipped it to me. Um, I got Michael and uh, my sister, and we went out to Old American Golf Club where they had the, the North Texas PGA section championship and about 50 of the pros there wrote, we did this little thing, just check a box. They want 24, 48 or 72 or whatever. And about everyone came through and at least hit 24 and um, to their club, everyone that, that had the buying power. Right. Yeah. And so we just put it together. We sold like, you know, we did like 50 something wholesale orders of between like 24 and may maybe the, at the most, somebody did a hundred pieces or something. And so all of a sudden I was like, okay, well, that's a lot of uh, orders to fill. And so I uh, started kind of asking for money, applying for new credit cards, whatever. And then I was like, that's 50 something orders. It's just me and Michael out of our house. Uh, that's a lot. And so, um, and we got the online, et cetera. And uh, I was like, we need an office. And so uh, two of our guys helped us out financially got us in our first office, got, we hired actually our apartment, um, manager as our first <laughs> office manager, like from, she, cause she always saw the boxes or whatever. And we're like, you know, what do you uh, want to do? And she took a chance and her name was Emily Davis. Uh, we'll never forget it. And so, yeah, she came in, was our first employee. Uh, and then I hired uh, another one and then my nephew came on and then we got up to seven employees. We're really scaling up and then COVID hit. Well, well, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, about four or five. Then we went down and then we got back up to about seven. And then uh, the supply chain is actually the year after COVID, the supply chain was kind of tanked. That was the hardest year actually. Yeah. And, uh, then since then we're, we're kind of working our way back up, but we're, we sell in, uh, 250 to 300 stores, um, and events and things like that. And, um, it's really picking up and we're, we're in some big places like, um, you know, we're a proof vendor for places like Omni Properties. Um, we we do all the merch for uh, a lot of the like mini tours. Uh, we've done Conference USA. We're a sponsor for them. Um, well, all, all sorts of cool partnerships and stuff. And so it's been pretty exciting. Never thought you'd be <clears throat> where you are now after you know coming out of Oklahoma no. playing golf. You just thought it'd be golf. So I mean, and then you said there are some guys on tour that are wearing. And some yes. of the smaller that are wearing some that are wearing the gear as well. Yeah. The problem is, you know, with those guys and how we've grown, and, uh, usually they'll wear it and get out there. And then like Josh Creel would be a great example. He's one of our best friends, helped us, helped us raise, you, you know, get out there. But then as soon as he gets an endorsement deal, he's like, Hey man, I got to wear this. We're like, dude, that's fine, man. Like that's, that was what we were trying to do the whole time. We, you can just wear it at the pool or go and fishing or whatever. Right. Yeah. Um, and so most of the time what happens is guys wear it till they get out there till they get a deal. And then, uh, and then they, you know, good for them, you know, and so we don't sponsor anybody, uh, with cash, uh, yet. Cause I, and I think that that is the right way to go. Cause we want to keep growing so we can do that. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, we've got, we've had players that have worn it. Um, you know, Rick Lamb actually wore it for a full season just to support. I guess he didn't have another deal. Uh, we've had Savannah Valalbi on the LPGA tour. Um, we, you know, tons of different players. I mean, a lot. I mean, it's hard to even believe sometimes how many guys 
where it and girls um, on on all the worldwide tours from Live to the PGA Tour to Senior PGA. Uh, Clark Dennis wears his own Champions Tour, um, and he's almost became like an honorary founder. He, he's the absolute man. Uh, you know, he's here in North Texas. He just finished, I think, about thirty eighth or so at the Senior PGA Briscoe. And so, um, yeah, he's our our Champions Tour guy. Okay. So it's yeah. interesting how this, like you said, how it all comes about, but all these stories are, you know, you're, you're, you're growing, you're growing. And then COVID hit and just wiped everything out and then, it is <laughs> and then having to start over, but just something that you guys believed in of how this is, um, you know, how this has grown. So you guys are international selling stuff as well, or just, just in the U S yeah, we, uh, we sell, um, to some places in Canada and then um, we've had some, Mec- with Mexico, we've had some issues, but we're we're working on getting down there. We've sold uh, down to Colombia before, but that kind of went out um, in COVID. And then now we're looking to try to go overseas to like South Africa and Europe. Um, but there's kind of some logistics there. I'm trying to figure it out. Well, that we can still- get in like one or two or there, but I'm trying to figure out on a wider scale how we can just you know not just to get it over there, but like to start actually distributing correctly. Gotcha. So there's, I mean, so it was just a gear that's, and that's the logo on the hat. That's the, mm-hmm. is that's yeah, not the original good. logo? That is, that is. We, okay. I, it just, the embroidery and stuff wasn't exactly up to, you know, we were figuring it out. We didn't know what a DST file, we didn't know what, what the hell we were doing. I mean, we knew nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so, just drawing it up with crayons and stuff. Yeah. And it, we, I mean, pretty much. I mean, we were just, however we could figure it out. And, uh, you know, my uncle was with Ralph Lauren. For like 25 years and then uh, i was living with a guy that was with uh nevo sligo and then now you know now he's he's been with all sorts of big brands or whatever they were always giving me a hard time you know because we, we were just making up as we go trying to figure it out and here we are we're still trying to do that but it's getting a lot nicer i mean we've got like this is uh you know full out active wear um yeah like it's pretty badass hat um so we're we keep advancing keep uh, next is polos. I'm working on that. I just, uh, I'm very particular. So I'm excited for that launch. Uh, as soon as we get it dialed in with the full line. Okay. So people can go to what is it? Surf and turf club.com or is it surf and turf golf? Surf and Which turf one com. Dot com. Okay. And they can go on mm-hmm. there and, and check it out and see what, uh, you know, what order and what's coming as well. Correct. Yes, absolutely. And then uh, we also have a stockist list. So if you ever want to pick it up in your area, you can go see, you know, whatever state you're in or city, you can see the uh, courses or shops that carry it. If it, okay. if it was easier. A lot of, a lot of people are still reluctant to go buy online uh, when they're trying on apparel, if they haven't worn it before. Gotcha. Okay. So I like to yeah. always push them that way. Yeah. By I the like way, to- I heard something about you. What's that? I heard. I heard you uh, kind of have a big head. Do we need to make like a special hat for you? I need a visor. I need a visor because <laughs> right. those things will fit. Hats fit like a yarmulke, depend if they're not deep enough. That's the problem. That's why I don't. I wear. I have one hat. I think that I wear golfing, and it's called Big Melon Gear. And their, okay. their their slogan was "One size never fits all." So it was deep. I need. I need a deeper hat. All right. Or I think a we got uh, one that could work, but or, but yeah, visors. Like visor. I said, I like visors or a um, the bucket hats. Those are. We don't do a bucket sh- hat anymore. We did before. Really? But I can work on. I can work on that. Yeah. Visor and that haircut of yours are. That's kind of risky. As, I mean, that's a lot like mine here. So it is. But <laughs> and I've just had it, and I, I've always had short hair since well, high school. We had it. We did. We had a hockey tournament. We grew mohawks, and we had a sh- our hair shaved short. And then once I got out of high school, I said, "Ah, I'm just going to take it all off." So it makes it easier, right? There's no. I think so, it's um, it's washed and comb. I'm done. Right? There's nothing it's to worry no about. It's stress. I I love it. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, so, I lost all mine, but you know. So Stuart Scott. <laughs> I remember Stuart Scott told me one day. He goes, "Man, she goes. Remember, bald is beautiful." So you know what? <laughs> I love that. That's good. So I said, yeah. So anytime down. I see that, yeah, I always I always live by that by that motto. So yeah, but it was uh, just fun. Like I said, it's but the problem is you sweat your eyes and everything else. So, but I yeah, don't we'll like get hair. You something. I'll get you dialed in. Yeah, you're right here. You're, you're, lo- you're local here. You're a North Texas guy yeah. too. So, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we'll definitely have to have the people that can check and they can check it out as on on the website and where else on social media can they check yeah, it out? Check uh, it out. Surf and Turf Club on Instagram. That's probably our biggest following. But you, Facebook, Twitter, uh, we've got a TikTok, but I I, uh, I don't use it as much. Um, and we don't have a. <laughs> I don't hate that word. Pro- Somebody says TikTok. Yeah. I don't know how got, to like, use it. Th- 
Are they called TikToks? I got we like three TikToks or whatever. I don't know. Is that what they're called? I, I don't know what they are. I just know that if it's you post it on one thing, it shows up on there. And I, I, I don't know how to do that stuff. I just don't want to hear about TikTok. I don't even know how, and it's how frustrating because it everybody's like, that's where it is. And then they're right. Like, and I even catch myself scrolling on Instagram. I'm watching TikToks on there or whatever. And I'm like, we need, we got to make TikToks. But the problem is, can you get up there and dance and do all your stuff? You know, uh, that's no, what you need to do. Put your key. golf gear on and get out there and just start hitting golf balls. I'm, I'm kind of back where I was playing golf. I'm kind of like, you know, afraid to pull the trigger. I don't know what, you know, like, <laughs> oh, I'm be, stalling over the well, maybe shot. Maybe it'll I'm be like, like a double. Do. Uh, what's the word you're looking for? Maybe it'll kind of, it'll, it'll cancel itself out because you're live on a TikTok trying to do it and think, oh, whatever, just hit it. Yeah. I, I need to just embarrass myself and just get likes that way, right? Well, I mean, that, I, I, that, hey, any publicity is good publicity, right? That's what I think. Exactly. Just be that's ourselves. All we, that's all we need. Yeah, that's all we need to do. But to yeah. get out, we definitely have to get out and play. Play more before Absolutely. it gets too hot down here. So we'll, we'll uh, have to have to uh, have to check it out and get out and play, but, and find it out in some stores and whatnot. So, but yeah, I like I'm a I like a medium shirt probably if you can. <laughs> I'll get you dialed in. <laughs> no get doubt. out and do all this, dude. Uh, but I appreciate you jumping on Taylor and telling your story about how it's, you know how guys are you know you start one way. You know, this is my plan. I got golf, and then, but here I am. I'm doing apparel. You never, never, you know, you never thought where you, you know, where you start, where you finish. So I had no, I had no idea. I mean, I, I always wondered that. And there was times when I was playing. One year, I get a sponsor or whatever, and, uh, and moving out to California was a big deal. But uh, you know, coming back, and I'd have to, um, you know, I, I coached a co- my college golf team for a little bit, um, and then I bartended. I, uh, you know, I, I was finding any way I could make money, you know, on the side or whatever. I was even trying to sell some, you know, golf stuff or whatever. I don't know, whatever I could do and, uh, lessons here and there. I never like giving lessons though, but, uh, yeah. And then I was wondered, okay, well, if I don't make it, what am I going to do? And I, I just, I never knew. I, I, I kind of wanted to be a golf coach, but I don't know. It didn't, didn't seem like it. And then it just stumbled into it, right? I think everybody stresses out. And I think if you just kind of open your eyes, it'll yeah. kind of show up in front of you, you know, when you least expect it. Yeah. Who's to say? I mean, you get out and in the next 10 years or whatever, you just start playing more and more golf. And, you know, maybe I could, you know, get back on on tour and do this, right? You, you I, never know. I would like uh, I would like that someday, uh, you know, with the timing and everything. I'm 35. So, um Senior tour that everybody can. It's a little bit shorter. We move us up, and you know, is that, maybe that, that, is that at fifty or is that forty five? Fifty, fifty. Okay. So maybe you never know. I don't know. I'm, I'm definitely not one to ever uh, not believe in myself. So I love if somebody told me I can't do it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's what I mean. You know, you never know what. So it'll be interesting. Yeah. Like you said to see how it go. You know, get out, start playing golf, and people are saying, "Hey, you know," and and then the uh, the apparel takes off and. Next, you know, you're making golf clubs and everything else, right? You've got that sure. going and then you're building, building some gigantic conglomerate with everything. So, yeah, it's know. like whatever I said, that'll never sell in Texas. It's like, yeah, you want to bet? That's the, <laughs> hey, you know, that's the beauty of, an, of, of, of athletes, right? This one, when you tell me, no, you tell me I can't do something. Yeah. It just makes me oh, work twice I, as hard to prove you, to prove you wrong. So every time I, I, I need it, you know, I don't like getting complimented too much. Uh, I need, I need uh, fuel on the fire. Exactly. And that's, you know, that's just how we're wired. And that's, you know, it everybody is. I've had on the show talk, that's just about how we are. Right. Don't tell me I can't. Right. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing. Cause uh, a lot of people welcome it. Yeah. Keep coming. Keep telling me I can't. Others can't. But that's what that mental game you talk about with some people just can't do it. And yours isn't the fact that you can't do it. It's just the fact that you just think you're, eh, as opposed to somebody else doing it. Right. We get in our own way. Right. Like, so you say, you just, let your abilities take over and, uh, and I, see. I, I, that's when I play the best always when I get underestimated, you know, and it's like, uh, yeah, just kick something into gear in there. And, yeah. that, and same thing with business too. The second I get told, you know, we don't have something, I don't know, I come up with an idea or, um, I don't know, something good happens. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, I don't like taking no for an answer ever. <laughs> no, not at all. I know, you, I know you know, you know how it goes. Yeah. Exactly. But, you know, that's what makes it fun. All right, I'll prove you mm-hmm. wrong. So For sure. Yeah. But Taylor, man, I appreciate you jumping on today and, and talking about this and, and seeing, like I said, somebody, hopefully somebody hears this and, and says, yeah, you know, hey, 
they're a golfer and they hear this and say, Hey, what can I do? You never know though. Right. Yeah. yeah. But we'll have to revisit this in, in, in a while and see, you know, I said, who's to say next time we talk and you're out there playing, you're playing on mini tours or something else. You just picked it back up and, and, uh, and take it off. Of these days, so, I'm, I'm caddying for my niece in the Colorado open next, next week. That's kind of a, a passing tour. I'm pumped about it. I'm so Sorry. Pumped. Where yeah, is that tournament cool. going to be? In, in Colorado and Denver oh. area. Okay. So, uh, it's like, you know, it's a huge event for men and women, hundred thousand dollars in the winter. Um, but it's just pretty cool because, you know, her dad used to caddy for me. And then uh, she used to caddy for uh, some ambassador, uh, ambassadors of ours when she was in high school. Didn't even know she played college golf. And now she's playing in the field, got an exemption, and get to caddy for her. And um, now I'm pumped about that. So that's kind of where, I'm in, where I'm she in a different school? chapter. Oral Roberts. Okay. In Tulsa. Yep. Okay. Yep. Her name is Morgan Palermo. I'm proud of her. She had a hole in one uh, at her conference tournament, and I missed it. I was out there too. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> but yeah, but okay. it, I'm proud of her. She's uh, yeah. she's the new star of the show. Well, that's good. Then you know, good luck with yeah. that and get, carrying that bag around the course with your jumpsuit on. I just got some practice have- in. I carried a, set, a U.S. Open sectionals 36 holes last week, and that was. I forgot what that was like, but <laughs> I can't imagine. It. it should be nice weather though in Denver. So yeah, yeah, it should be good. Should Have be your good. gear all out there and everything else. So take some extra gear with you. You never know. They want the buy yeah, stuff. Not. Well, I probably will. It's at one of my accounts. That's a cool thing too. So they'll be selling our stuff in the shop there. Oh, even better. So, yeah, even better. It's a, that's that's one of the ones that's given us a shot since day one, and they crush it. So that'll be exciting. Perfect. Perfect. Yeah. Well, well, good luck with that, man. Like I said, we'll we'll be in touch and. uh Good luck with all this. And like I said, we'll definitely have to revisit this and see where you are uh, down the road. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I appreciate Appreciate it. it. Yeah. Thanks, Taylor. Appreciate it.